I will go out, I'll buy a new flowers, and I'll personally plant them up. I mean, but with intent, I mean, that, that becomes a destruction of someone's property. Right. All right. I want to bring on Stefan Kinsella. How are you doing, Stefan? I'm good. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah, you, we can hear you clear. You're Fantastic. How you doing? Really well, actually. <laughs> it's one of the best audios on here. Anyway, um, no, good, good to have you on the show. I, obviously, we had a we had a, a scenario earlier with Facebook pages and the rest of this stuff. I'm going to kind of uh, lay out. Some people have already heard this. We had some, a, kind of a short discussion on earlier on before you came on, but I want to clarify. Uh, some people had basically messaged Facebook and reported another Facebook page, uh, lying that they this Facebook page had supposedly broken Facebook rules and guidelines when they had not, uh, but they claimed this, they got the face, this voluntary uh, Facebook page shut down. And we were, it raised the question, uh, you know, what is lying? What is fraud? When does it infringe on NAP? And I want to, you know, I figured Mr. Argumentation Ethics himself have you on the show. We could uh, discuss this tonight. So anyway, I want to start off right off, right off the gate with the fact that uh, lying, what, what's the difference between lying and fraud? Let's start with that. Yeah, so so just really quickly, um, I actually didn't follow all the details of the issue, and I'm aware of other cases where um, people have gotten um, websites taken off, usually by copyright grounds or other things. And my suspicion is that most of these cases, the, there are policies in place that probably would not be in place in a free society. Um, they're heavily influenced and distorted by the government uh, policies on a, a variety of laws. Um, Copyright and child pornography and terrorism and money laundering and drugs and all these things. So, uh, and most of the time, it's um, when a, a site gets taken down or a YouTube video. I think it's not good, and I think it's because of state policies, largely. Um, so, you ask, what about lying and fraud? And I think this is because there's allegations that someone was being fraudulent. Now, it could be that someone was abusing Facebook policies. But on the other hand, Facebook has the right to set their own policies, right? Um, now, of course, I'm against lying as a general matter. I think it's immoral and bad, just like insulting your grandma is a bad thing, but that doesn't mean insulting your grandma is the same thing as lying or vice versa, and it doesn't mean that they're the same thing as fraud. Okay, So I think we can be against lying as people, and we should be, but it's not the same as fraud. People sometimes conflate these things, and then in terms of fraud, as libertarians, we're against fraud because we say it's a type of or a species of aggression or trespass, and people are usually a little bit vague about this. Um, my view is that fraud is basically what you can call in the common law theft by trick. Okay, It's using deception to obtain the possession and or title to some scarce resource. Without the legitimate or true consent of the owner, just like if you um, if you're a surgeon and you perform an operation on someone, it's not assault and battery to cut them open because they consented to it. But if they don't give informed consent, that is, if you lie to them as the surgeon about what you're going to do, you put them out and you say you're going to remove their kidney and instead you remove their left foot, that is assault and battery because there was no informed consent given. To that, okay. So, to me, fraud is simply a, a means by which you perform a type of theft um, of someone's resources. So, what is theft? Theft is simply the unconsented to use of someone's property or, or, or scarce resources. So, when we say unconsented to, that means they didn't consent to it. So, that's what theft or robbery. Um, is. So fraud is a way of doing that. It's a way of, say, engaging in a trade with someone where you condition your transfer of title to your resource on their – and the other party's uh, transfer of title to their resource in the exchange. But there's a certain communication between the parties about what that transfer is. So communication and language are an in inherent part of any kind of complicated exchange like that. So fraud comes in when there's a deception or a misrepresentation by one party, which basically renders the transfer of title by the other party inoperative or uninformed. So to me, fraud is just a means by which you obtain possession of someone else's resources without their true consent. 
Okay, no, that, that makes perfect sense. So in this scenario, let's say, well, this, this raises the question, what if somebody frauds somebody else not to gain their property, but so somebody else can gain their property? You see what I'm getting at here? So give me, I fraud give me, what you, do you mean, give me an example. I, I fraud you so that Robert benefits or that so Chiron or, or, or Michael Dano on here benefits. So I don't get the property, but it deprived you of it. That still counts, right? I don't – I think you have to be precise about it. I don't know okay. if it – I mean I think it would be immoral. It would be shady. It would be slimy. But depending upon the circumstances, look, the person who is transferring title to property, if I hand you a dollar bill or my sheep in exchange for whatever you're giving me, I'm doing that based upon your representations, okay? Okay. And if you're lying to me, then I could have a claim that you're basically stealing that thing from me that I gave to you because I, I gave it to you on the condition that you weren't lying. So if you come up with a third-party transaction, it depends on the nature of it. I, I, I'm not sure. I mean I, I think in some cases it's caveat emptor or caveat donor, I guess. You know, uh, Let the donor beware. If you're going to, if I'm going to give you something based upon your grandma's representation or your friend's representation, then it's not clear to me who's defrauding me, right? Who who is taking my property without my consent? Because the guy that's lying to me is not really defrauding me. In the case of Facebook, I think that primarily, if someone abuses Facebook's terms of service and re and reports a violation when they shouldn't. Then it's up to Facebook how stringently they want to enforce that, and their remedy is obvious. They can just eject you, right? They can just boot the guy off, so they have an easy remedy. Theoretically, they could have a, a damages remedy too. They could sue you if that's in the contract as well, but it wouldn't be a, a right on behalf of the person whose page is removed unless Facebook was foolish enough to put their, their terms of service that… All of their customers have a third-party right to go through them to get monetary damages from other users. They're not going to go through that. It's not worth it to them. I think they're just going to have to have a reputation that they're not going to be arbitrary and they're, that they're going to be fair. I mean if they start booting people off left and right, no one's going to trust their service, and they're going to go to some alternative competing service. So I think reputation is the main thing that keeps Facebook um, honest here. All right, so uh, so basically you're basically saying that only the depriv – uh, somebody depriving somebody else of property th through a lie is considered fraud. Is that a good summarization? Yes, I think that is, and that's because the libertarians – the libertarian argument is basically we're, we're opposed to aggression, which is trespass, which is the use of someone else's resources, including their bodies, without their permission or their consent. That is the essence of the libertarian claim. And contracts are just uh, an application of that. A contract is not a type of property. A contract is what a property owner does with his property. In other words, a contract is the means by which an owner exercises his property rights. If I own a resource, that means that I can permit you to use it, like I can invite you to my home for dinner, or I can exclude you. I can deny you the right to use it. Um, or I can grant you the rights to use it on a contractual basis for a limited period of time or for limited uses, like if it's renting me a car. They let me use the car for a limited time and for limited purposes, but not for any purpose. I can't melt the car down or sell it. Um, or I can alienate the, the title to the car completely, which is a complete and final contract. So a contract is simply the way by which an owner of a resource… Um, decides and, and communicates to others who gets to use the resource and for how long. Um, and fraud is just another application of that. Fraud is just um, um, the recognition that if there's dishonesty or deception involved in one of these kind of communications, then it could result in the unconsented to use of a resource. So it really all comes down to property rights in scarce resources and who has the right to control the use of that resource. One last question that does touch on this with the Facebook contract and stuff, because it, it really is. It's I know it's it's one of those regular user end agreements where you just kind of scroll down and click continue, right? But that's what it really is with Facebook. When you sign up, you you do the thing and you basically sign a small mini contract with them on a few basic small things, right? I mean, I guess you don't have to really sign off on anything, but it's kind of like an implicit contract instead of explicitly. I think it's I, well, I think it's in in the in Facebook case, it's I don't think it's implicit. I think it's uh it's not signed. It's more of a click wrap, right? Or, or a, a click type agreement. You actually click on something. So I think okay. there's some affirmative 
indication of agreement. Okay, and by by agreeing, by, by promising to use their services, by using their services, you're promising not to lie to them about things, right? I think that's that would probably, if we went through their stuff, they probably yeah. would have something in there about that being a bad thing. Uh, and they set that rules. We didn't have to have a government do that. Uh, basically, I would have set that rule with somebody else, right? Yes. yes. And so, right, right. And so uh, because of that, they, if they do lie, would you consider that technically an, a, an infringement on the non-aggression principle because they're breaking contract? No, I don't think so because – so here's the way I look at it. Facebook is granting uh, limited and temporary permission for you and me and other people to use their resources, which is their computer servers, let's say. right? So you are actually controlling their computer um, hard drives and RAM through the internet. So they're allowing you to do that. Just like if I call you on the phone, I'm controlling when I when I cause your telephone to ring, I'm actually causing it to do something. So I'm controlling your phone. Um, but you're permitting me to do that by your uh, by your cooperation in the telephone network, for example, right? Um, Facebook is saying we're going to let you use our servers under these terms. Now. I think there's there's two ways you could look at it. You could say that if Facebook's – so if I let, – let's say I invite you to my home for dinner, and I say you can use my home for a certain purpose, but you're, you're not allowed to wear shoes in my home and scuff my floors up. And let's say you leave your shoes on and you scuff my floors up. Now, have you committed trespass by scuffing up my, my floors? Um, well, it's arguable, but the easy remedy is just to eject someone who's not being a polite guest. Right? In Facebook's case, I think their terms of service are more like um, setting out the rules on which they're going to keep – let you keep using their property because they really don't need to let you keep using it. They can just boot you. But if they did want to set up a contract by which they, um, they have the right to get damages from you, let's say sue you for monetary damages. Let's say they put that in the contract, and they say – um, they say if anyone violates the following terms of service, then you have to pay me a thousand dollars damages or some kind of damages. I think that should be enforceable, but I wouldn't view it as trespass. It would just be an action that is defined in the contract that triggers a consequence, and the trigger, the consequence that would be triggered would be the transfer of title to some resources, like some money, some monetary, some monetary damages. So. I think someone who lies to Facebook um, to get someone's page ejected is basically violating Facebook's terms of service, and whether Facebook wants to enforce it by booting that person or to vigorously police that is really up to Facebook because they're not going to obviously police everything with a big inquiry. It would be too expensive, so they have to have rough and ready rules of thumb that they apply. Um, so I wouldn't call it trespass. I would say that the person is risking getting booted from the venue. All right. Do any of the panelists want to follow up on this? Ask a consolidated question. Well, yeah. I had. Uh, I, I think that part of this at least came up due to uh, you know an interaction that we had had earlier, and I, I I think that you know if somebody goes and basically interferes with uh, with with my interactions with with Facebook or with anybody else you know if they're if they're going out of their way to not deprive me of property in the sense of taking it for themselves but essentially vandalizing my my time and uh, access to a resource in a fraudulent manner that they that they are you know through deception vandalizing I mean do you think do you think it's not possible for someone to dishonestly vandalize and therefore uh, you know be be an NAP violator well, see, when you say essentially, and when you say, I mean, so I'm trying to establish what fraud is, so you can't just call it fraud, right? And um, you can't just say essentially vandalizing or whatever. I think that um, it's well. It's, I mean, you know, they it, deprived me of time and access to a resource, have they not? Well, and you said go out of your way. I mean, like that's a relevant consideration. And yeah, they're not depriving you of anything that you have a property right in. I mean, do you have a property right in your time and resources that you've? That you're investing in a private contractual network like Facebook, I don't really see that that's the libertarian uh, project. Well, my my understanding of my agreement with Facebook is that like I I follow the rules and I use the service. So if somebody goes and you know uh, through deception deprives me of my interaction with that entity, I think that they've you know done something dishonest and deprived me of a resource. 
Okay, I think that is a fair description of what they've done. So, so what? Dishonestly depriving a person of resources you don't see as fraud. No. Okay. No, I just explained. Fraud, fraud is the deceptive uh, acquisition of the control of a resource that someone else owns, especially theft by trick. Okay, well, so this, it, this is the problem with not being precise in our terms. Fraud is used to describe dishonesty and things that are immoral that I think everyone would agree is immoral. Okay, but it's not. If you use fraud so broadly, then it's not always a violation of the non-aggression principle. Well, I, I I don't try to use it broadly. I mean, I I made you know earlier I was on the show earlier and I you know specifically said I mean there's a there's people who lie about me all the time. I have enemies, right? But I don't necessarily say that they're fraudulent. They're not depriving me of anything. If the if the if the line between fraud and just a lie is whether you actually obtain a thing from your lie, then then I think that there needs to be like another word. I'm not sure that there's a word for vandalism by deception because you know I'm I'm clearly yeah, having there a, is yeah. there, there is it's called defamation, which is a type of reputation right which libertarians oppose. Well, we don't believe in property rights and value. We don't believe in property rights and reputation. We don't believe in property rights and ideas or patterns of information. No. So, yes, no, there is a word for thing. it, and it's just not a libertarian concept. No, I, 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 I think, think, excuse me, Chris. because the, the, the thing is that I've, I've really tried to draw a very clear line here, that a person is not just depriving me of my reputation, right, because people do that all the time. I'm not, I'm not unused to that. That happens every day, right? People go out and say, you know, all types of things about me. I, you know, like I said, I have enemies. I'm not trying to go and, like, seek restitution or call these people aggressors. But when you're actually seeking out to deprive me of uh, resources, my uh, my my uh, interaction with this uh, organization that I hold on, I hold on. So, so 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 let's stop right. So you're saying an interaction is a resource? It's it's an advertising platform. An advertising platform is a resource. Yes. It's a resource that's an ownable thing in the world. I mean, see, libertarians believe that in property rights to scarce <laughs> resources, these are the things that there can be conflict over. Um, your your usefulness of a platform like Facebook, just because you find use in it doesn't mean it's a thing that can be owned. Um, not every end of action is an ownable thing, right? I mean action is aimed at a certain pursuit of an end in general, but not all these ends are ownable things. Is, is it then okay to transfer you know, someone? Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. The question is not whether key. something's okay or not. That's not the libertarian question whether something's okay or not. Well, is it is it fraud to take someone's Bitcoin private key and transfer their Bitcoins to your wallet? It depends. It, no. Well, who, who would be defrauded in that, by, by that action? The how, did you the obtain, how did you obtain your the private? Look, I'm not I'm not an I'm not an advocate of intellectual property here, generally, Stephen. But I, I would say that like you know that that there are things that there is such a thing as value in this world that is not like a chunk of you know matter in your I, hand. I don't, right? I don't so deny like, that there is value, but but that's not a subject of property rights. Okay. So can I, can I redirect this? Can, may I redirect this real quick, please? Okay. Um, the question I believe is this: that there's a Facebook platform that he is using CPU cycles and RAM and computer hardware that is property okay it is scarce resources they have sublicensed the use of those in some agreement with Christopher there is a group that has through the use of lies attempted to gain control over Christopher's use of those resources such that they are blocked and not being used by him now they are gaining ownership of those by creating a what they want the use to be, which is nothing. So they I, are. I, I, underst I understand the argument, right? The the problem with the argument is it's, it's it's this is why I brought up the libel case. It's exactly the case with libel and reputation rights. This is basically and implicitly an intellectual property argument. Uh, um, in the case of reputation rights, what you're saying is, um, if I if if I uh, tell a lie about someone else and I make other people not deal with that person, then I've hurt them, right? I've 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 I've, I've harmed them economically. But all I'm doing is persuading the other people to change their minds. Even if I'm telling a lie, they have the right not to deal with someone else. 
In this case, the, and this is why reputation rights cannot be uh, sustained in libertarian theory. In this case, Facebook, you don't really have a contractual right to use Facebook's property. It is a license in the technical sense that license is simply permission. Just like if I invite someone to my house for a par for a party and I can eject them at will, right? Or if I hire someone to work at my physical factory, I give them license to use my equipment in my factory as long as I don't fire them, right? But I can fire them at will. Right. So the license is like totally temporary. In Facebook's case, I'm pretty sure Facebook is not giving you a contractual right to use their services for any for any longer than they decide not to let you use it. In other words, they can boot any of us off at any time. So could Gmail or whatever. Now, if they use that power arbitrarily, they're going to lose customers because people aren't going to trust them, and they're going to go to someone else who has a better reputation or charges for the service and gives you a lease, some kind of long-term property right in their, in their resources. So I think that all that's going on here is someone is violating their terms of service with Facebook, arguably, by committing deception or abusing the, the rules, and they are persuading Facebook to use their rights to kick someone else's Facebook page off. Now, the question to me is whose rights are violated by the deception? Are Facebook's rights violated? Maybe. But their remedy is very easy. They can simply kick off the person who they don't like, right? Who's lying to them, or is are the rights of the person whose page was was uh, was taken down violated? I don't think so because they Facebook has the right to take their page down whenever they want, and I guarantee the terms of service specifies that if you set up a Facebook page, Facebook maintains the right, reserves the right to remove your page at any time for any reason whatsoever. So if they do that, even if the reason they take it down is because they're relying upon the fabrications of a malicious third party, they have the right to do that, which means that the person whose page is taken down did not have any property rights violated. So again, I'm not sure who the plaintiff would be in a lawsuit, and the only one I can think of would be Facebook, but their remedy is very simple. They can simply remove the person whose actions they don't like. So no, I don't think it's fraudulent in the technical sense of fraud. No, this is a, this is a great discussion, guys. Great I mean, answer. No, this is a great discussion here. Who who else wants to go next? Anybody else want to add to this? I I thought that we it was interesting that uh, it it sounded to me like you said that there was no like property right in Bitcoin. Could you elaborate on that, Stephen? Um, and my view on this is tentative because I'm still trying to understand Bitcoin, to be honest. <laughs> Um, but I don't think there's a property right in Bitcoin because it's not a scarce resource yes, um, at all. And in fact, even the terms of service don't prohibit – see, the example you gave earlier about stealing someone's Bitcoin or something like that by uh, – the, the, to my mind, the, the way the system is set up, the only way you're going to get someone's uh, private key is uh, you can't guess it. So really, as a practical matter, the only way you would ever obtain their key is if they are stupid and they gave it to you at a bar, or they were drunk, or they allowed you access to their, you know, their private system, or you trespassed against their property, like broke into their home, got into their computer, and got their password. Now that's an act of trespass, which should be prohibited, and the effects of that can be taken into account in computing the damages owed uh, for the act of trespass. But the Bitcoin system, as I understand it, which is pseudonymous, right, doesn't require any user to even sign on to any kind of terms of service whatsoever. So my understanding from people that know more about Bitcoin than I do is that Bitcoin's rules do not prohibit you from taking someone's Bitcoins from them if you happen to find the key somehow. They don't prohibit that at all. Um, so it's not even a technically a violation of any kind of terms of service you could point to. Um, so it's not a contract right. It's not a property right. It's simply a reliable scheme that people can can use for practical purposes. Um, in a sense, it functions as an analog of property rights, and in, in some ways it's better than property rights. But I don't think technically the Bitcoin system um, can be said to create items or objects that can be considered ownable things. In fact, the word Bitcoin is just a metaphor. There's no such thing as a Bitcoin. It's just ledger entries in a private scheme that some people decide to participate in, and would you call a pointer a, an ownable thing? 
would you call a ledger entry a property right? It makes no sense. Okay, one quick uh, pointer to, to correct you on. Um, uh, Bitcoins are essentially, a, they are a, a scarce resource. Even though they are digital entries, there are only a max, there is a maximum number of Bitcoins that can exist. And so... Um, yeah, within, the, within the system. Right, and in essence, they function the same way that yeah, but any you, other. But you, other correct, other. Tell me if I'm wrong. You could copy the entire. I could. Co I could make a copy of the entire blockchain right now. Yeah. Right, and you and I and everyone in this in this uh, hangout could start having our separate Bitcoin little trading system using a, a, an exact duplicate of the existing blockchain. They right? call those alternate cr uh, cryptocurrencies, right? Exactly. Right. So, so there's nothing that's a scarce re – so every time someone says it's a scarce resource, they always qualify it with this. They always say, well, a Bitcoin is a scarce resource within the Bitcoin network. Well, that's not how real scarce resources work. They're not scarce resources within a system. They are scarce resources in the universe, in reality, right? Um, Right. Well, there's so, only a certain amount of there's only a certain amount of um, pointers that can be accessed within the Bitcoin system, right? So within yes, the system, there's only exactly. a certain amount. Right. There's there's only a certain amount of three dimensional markers in the Earth system. However, if you when it went to the Europa system and uh, create an identical copy of everything that's in a three dimensional space on Earth. Sure, you could have those duplications. It still does not mean that there are they aren't scarce. It's just because well, you have you, a copy you, over you there that, doesn't I mean, mean that you let's have... say we let's say that ten people are playing Monopoly at my home, okay? Then we have this Monopoly uh -huh. game. There's only a defined number of Monopoly fake currency units within that system, right? But they're right. not really money. It's just it's just a scheme or a game that we're all playing. I just don't see. I mean, first of all, Bitcoin is not a thing that. There's not a Bitcoin, right? There's there are entries in a ledger, right? There's a defined number of of units. In fact, they're not even coins. It's just just because the word coin is attached to it doesn't mean they're really currency units, right? It could be used for anything. Why don't we call them bit ledgers? You know, you know what I mean. We we got to sure. be careful not to be attached to the the physicalist meanings of overly metaphorical. You can call terms. it whatever you want. The yeah, point that's is my that point. The point, the point is, though, that they are, they are scarce in that there is only one valid entry that can be used per, quote, unquote, Bitcoin or bit ledger value. And those values are, are in existence in that particular world. And if you wanted to go to a different world and have a different you know, unique value there, you could, but it's still not a Bitcoin. It's something else. Well, I don't know what a Bitcoin is really. I mean, in, 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 a, in a metaphysical sense, I'm still not sure. I mean, I don't disagree with anything you're saying technically. I just think the interpretation – this is a co construct on top of a reality that already exists. This is just the way humans interact with each other, and we already have property rules that define who owns the f this physical scarce resources in the world. That's already done, and how we want to manipulate these things and arrange our affairs with each other is fine. That's one thing. And if we want to have a contract with each other, we can do that. But there is no contract with Bitcoin as far as I, I'm aware. I mean correct me if I'm wrong, but no one clicks on a I accept these terms of service when they use Bitcoin. Well, no, right? it's, a, it's a decentralized you know, uh, system. It's basically a standard of conduct, if you will, more than a, more than a contract. But, I mean, we generally tend to acknowledge, I mean, <clears throat> you know, if, if, the, uh, if the bank decided to, you know, transfer all your money into another bank account tomorrow, uh, you know, okay, these are just digits in a computer, but at no, the same time. No, 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 but, no, but the, first of all, there's a contract, a contract with the bank. There's a contract with the bank, and if they're… Yeah, and plus, that system is heavily distorted by the way the state um, has manipulated it. In, in any private real banking system, if you deposit your gold with a bank, you're going to have a contract specifying who owns the gold. I mean it's one way or the other, right? Yep. The gold is an ownable thing. There's no dispute about that. So I just don't see that – look, I could be – like I said, my views on this are tentative. I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, the one problem may be the word scarcity. Okay, the word scarcity is used by Austrians, basically, is a synonym for the economic concept of rivalrousness, right? Right. And I don't think you could argue that the so-called bitcoins, which is, to my mind, the word the word bitcoin is a word that 
correlates with a concept, and the concept is just a convenient way that we'll we categorize and understand the way the system oper the system works. Right? I could you could e is easily call them pointers. Okay, if you call them pointers, I don't think people are going to talk about owning pointers because it just doesn't make it doesn't doesn't fit into that metaphorical framework that we're used to. Um, and I don't think you need property rights for bitcoins. I mean, the question is whose property rights were violated by what action? Are, um, so the only there's only two ways I can think of that you can say quote unquote steal someone's bitcoins. Number one, you give me your password by negligence or by stupidity or by trust. Okay, in which case there's some kind of implicit contract between us that I breached, or or it's your it's your it's your negligence, or I broke into your home or your computer and I stole the password. Okay, so if I do that, then I've committed trespass then against the physical resource that you own. So regular property rights are totally sufficient to prevent widespread theft, so-called of bitcoins. I think. I mean, this is my take on it. I could be wrong about this, but I haven't heard. A good argument so far that bitcoins are ownable uh, things. Well, only one person can own a bitcoin at a time, or let's call it a satoshi. We'll just use a satoshi. Yeah, but they don't. But they don't own it. I mean, that's question well, begging. No, I would they, deny. They, 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 they have ownership it. in that they have control. Control. And use use of. Now, let's just say for a, another example of a theft that you would agree is theft, that would be comparable. Um, let's say that we have a worldwide um, titling. Service that's done through the computer system. Somebody hacks into the computer system and changes the owner listing for a, a section of land so that it says their name instead of the other person's name. Well, that's what's happening in the case of a, a Bitcoin being you know, misappropriated to someone else through fraud. Yeah, but uh, okay. If, if there's actual fraud, then that's already prohibited. Uh, we have to define fraud. But it, it, the the problem with the yes, example, but... I think, it's a little question begging because we both agree that land, let's say, is ownable. Okay. Right. But all they did was change a data value in a in a ledger, and now they have ownership of the land. Well, but they don't the have ownership person. of the land. According to all in understandings, they do. Well, what because does that mean? According, I mean, uh, the 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 title is what gives you. The claim of ownership of that land. Well, it depends on what people have agreed to. If I agree to put my land into some kind of trust or some kind of system, which I agree that whatever the rules of the system are, however it shakes out, I agree to abide by that. So I'm taking the risk that someone could manipulate the system or whatever and get ownership of my property. Then I've contractually agreed to that, but most people would not agree to that. But the point is most people agree that land so, – so let me give a, a more real-world example. If, if I guess your password, okay, let's say you're careless with your passwords. okay. Let's say you have a Bank of America account, and I just guess your password, and I walk into a Bank of America store tomorrow. I pretend like I'm you, now, and I, I, I give them your password, and I'm able to access your bank, your safety deposit box and take out your – um, your mother's favorite necklace or whatever that's in there. Okay, Now, you actually own that scarce resource. The fact that I'm able to d deceive the custodian into giving me trans uh, access to it doesn't mean that I now own it. It just means I've basically stolen it, Okay, and by do and I've done it. Basically, it's just an act of theft because I don't have your consent to use the necklace. You still own the necklace. And I probably have trespassed against the property of Bank of America because I've lied to them in contravention of their implicit, if not explicit, policies when I enter the door. I have to agree to certain rep representations and warranties when I walk into their property. That's implicit. That's a condition of my using their property. They're saying you can only use our property if you're not lying to us, if you're telling the truth, blah, blah, blah. That's how I got access to it. So. That kind of case, we already agree there's a scarce resource that is owned. In the case of Bitcoin, I don't see what it is that I am taking that is already agreed upon as owned. It's like it's like the argument is trying to be reverse engineered. It's like you're trying to make it look like the other case and say that because it looks like it in structure, the thing that's being taken must be ownable too, and I just am not persuaded by that. 
So you made the example as if if you had uh, if you had deceived Bank of America to go into Bank of America and take the take the necklace out of the safety deposit box. So that constitutes fraud. You're taking property. If you go into Bank of America, you deceive Bank of America. You go in there and you destroy the necklace and you walk out of there. What is that? I think that would be a conversion or a type of theft. Yeah, you're using someone's property without their consent. And if you use it for five minutes and you put it back, that's one type of damage. If you use it for five minutes and destroy it, that's a different type of damage. So they're both types of trespass or, or aggression, but the damages are different. Just like if you kidnap someone and rape them, it's different than if you kidnap them and let them go five minutes later. I mean once you commit an act of trespass, then the question becomes one of the extent of the damage you, you commit um, doing the action that you don't have the right to perform. This is so, I mean, just... fraud, fraud then is not necessarily like theft. I mean, fraud can be vandalism then. Fraud is a type of theft. I don't know what you mean. It's not like theft. Well, I'm saying you're you're basically saying that to you know to to if I if I take something and I obtain value from it, if I take no, I, ne uh, I never said anything about value. Can we define value then? Because I'm confused. We don't need to. I, I did say that that the the amount of damages that you do to the victim can play a role in how you measure the amount of restitution that's owed, but it's not because you have property rights and value. And I notice you keep going back to this, which is what everyone keeps doing um, because there's this conception, this conceptual confusion about the basis of property rights. And this is why I brought up the defamation and the, pro and the IP thing earlier because it always comes back to this, and you got to stay away from that because there are no property rights and value, and just because… There are more damages owed for a serious act of aggression than a lesser act of aggression does not mean that there are property rights in value. It simply doesn't. It means that you did a worse harm to someone through an illegitimate act that you had no, no right to commit, but it doesn't mean that you have a property right in value whatsoever. Yeah, we're just going to disagree on that one. Okay, well, that's, this is why your view leads to IP, which is exactly what I said earlier, which I knew it would come to. No, it doesn't lead to IP. Again, it I've does. said before. I mean, people have you know said terrible things about me, and I don't go around demanding restitution for it. But at the uh, same time, what you what you personally do in your life has nothing to do with the access to a resource. Concepts. To to fraudulently deprive me of access to a thing of value is a problem. That's you know, and well, I, I think you're using thing of value to refer to an economic good, which is okay. It's slightly imprecise, but that's fine. But that doesn't mean there are property rights in value. The essential, the essential problem with an act of trespass is, is the unconsented to use of the owned scarce resource of another person, period. That is basically all that libertarianism is opposed to. That's it. I mean we are 100% for the property rights of an owner legitimately acquired in a scarce resource, which means the physical integrity… In the borders of some kind of material thing in the world, and yes, those things have value to their owners. So what? That is not – that doesn't mean that there's a property right in the value. All acts of trespass, all rights violations are always necessarily uh, unconsented to invasions of the borders of, manipulations of the integrity of things without the consent of the owner. That's all they ever can be. So I want to ask you a real quick question, just kind of, an, I don't know, an odd thing. Um, let's say that we've got a modern virtual reality, you know, Matrix-like, or some sort of uh, <clears throat> advanced, you know, what is it, uh, third world, or, you know, there was a video game that... Uh, where you could live an alternate life or you know life two or something I don't remember what it was second called. second uh, life yeah, second or life like yeah that. second life let's say you've got a second life thing and um, it's set up as a a open source kind of thing um, so there's really no there's no contract I mean you basically you go on to it and you set up your stuff and the way it's set up is that there's exclusive only one time use of um, this virtual matter that that exists in this virtual world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so somebody goes in there and they're they're a cracker, and they're able to break into the system. And what they do is they crack into it and they assign 
exclusive ownership of a uh, mansion to someone else or to themselves. And uh, it was a mansion that you worked your ass off in this virtual world to obtain. And it's now, they, you know, they can walk into it, but you can't go into it. Mm -hmm. Is this now, even though it's virtual, is it now actually ownable property? I mean, uh, my answer is probably clear by now. I would say... No. I would say pro probably... Well, I would say no, except you could imagine a case where... There is a contract with the service provider. Okay, let's say you're, you know, all these people are customers of Second Life or whatever, right? So you're using their property when you're part of this this system. And I guess you could have a totally decentralized system that no one owns, right? You're just kind of floating out there. Um, but if that doesn't work as well as one where there's an owner of like a Facebook or a Google or a Second Life. Then people are going to gravitate towards the ones where there's an owner who has the ownership rights over the servers, etc., and everyone is using that with the permission of the owner. And the owner should have certain rules. And unless they have good rules in place, either practical or legal, right, to prevent this from happening, they're going to lose customers. No one's going to want to use it. They're not going to want to invest the time uh, in their activities unless they they're confident that they can, uh, you know, maintain what they've created, etc. Right. I mean, I think my son is into into Minecraft, and they have this problem called griefers. They they have something similar, but I think this just operates according to the rules of the owner of the of the network. It's like if you go to Disney World. So let me give you an analogy. Let's say you go to Disney World, and there's a practice of getting in lines or queues, right, to to stand in line for things. Yeah. And there's sort of these informal rules for when you can have someone or at a, or, at a, or at a mall waiting in line for the Apple Store to open for a new iPhone announcement. There's sort of these informal rules for places in line, right? Like someone's third in line, and they might sleep there overnight, and everyone assumes they have a, a pseudo or quasi-property right in that place in line. But they don't really have an actual property right in the place in line. What people are doing is they're using rules that are similar to the rules we use for allocating property rights and scarce resources for these semi-scarce aspects of a private situation. And this is all done under the... Um, approval of the owner of the mall or Disney or whatever, right? They're allowing you to do that. Now, if they had a big sign that posted and they said no queuing is allowed or queuing is allowed but only by uh, by race or lineage or whatever instead of by first come, first serve, then that would be the rule instead. But they're implicitly or tacitly permitting this behavior to happen, right? And if someone got out of line, metaphorically speaking, someone didn't respect the rules of the queuing process – and was too um, too rowdy. Maybe the security guards would get called, and they would be booted from the whole facility. So you have these processes by which people use property rights like features because they work in reality. But there's not really a property right in a line on someone else's private property. It's just the the using of the contractual system that the owner has implicitly allowed to take place. And I think something similar to that is how you would classify what goes on. Within a private scheme that people join, it's under either it's either decentralized or under someone else's ownership, like Second Life, um, or whatever. Um, you know, if you enter a uh, Dungeons and Dragon tournament at the local comic book shop, then you're really on their property, right? And all the guys are playing D and D, but they can be kicked out at any moment. But if you start have an owner act capriciously or not kick out the guys that are being the jerks. Then they're going to lose business, and people aren't going to go there. So I don't, I don't really think these are property rights. Um, I think they are the result of property rights. Um, they're relations that result from the enforcement of property rights in scarce resources. No, good stuff, guys. We got to, we got to end the show now. I got to do some closing statements. But uh, everyone, I, I thank you guys, Kinsella and and uh, Chris Cantwell, both you guys for joining us tonight. It was obviously a, a very good discussion. I think we all learned something, and the viewers can take something away from this video. So I do appreciate it, guys. Thank you for having me, and thank you, uh, St uh, Stefan. I I I will think about it and write on it, and uh, you know, I I would look forward to hearing your critique of what I wrote on it later on. Sounds good. Awesome guys. All right. Well, good to good to have good to have, good to have you guys on the show. Uh, I also want to thank the panelists for being on the show as well. Kyron, Dano, Kruger. Thank you guys. Pleasure. All right. All right. Good stuff. Good so.
as you guys know, we have the free bumper sticker giveaway. The winners this week were Pessoa de Gama, Pippi Glockencake, and username FTWBK. Man, those were some random usernames there, but you guys are the winners, so contact us over on Statism of Slavery, where we now have 182,000 subscribers and growing every day. And those are sponsored by nonaggression-apparel.com, so make sure you guys check out that online store. Hook them up so uh, they, they help us with our operations. And you can always find these shows over at voluntaryvirtues.com. Next, on the 18th, not next week, but the week after that, I have Robert Murphy on the show, and I was just invited to the Foundation for Economic Education. They're going to pay for me to go for a full seminar, pay for a hotel and everything, so I'm really excited about that. And I, I will be keeping you guys updated on what's going on there. I'm obviously going to give them a lot of uh, highlight and attention. <laughs> Who would have thought, right, for... Uh, Patting me on the back, I return the favor. But anyway, I'm really excited about that, so I will keep you updated as we move forward. And, as always, you can find our show over on libertymovementradio.com. It's always syndicated over there every Tuesday night, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is Mike from Voluntary Virtues saying thank you. Thank you guys so much for your spreading the freedom. I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a great night. Bye-bye.